Good afternoon. Welcome to 404. Thank you all for being here again with us. Uh, it's one o'clock promptly. I'm going to give it a few more seconds for people to start coming into the room. Mad pillows. Um, so if you've never joined us before, 44 is really just an exercise in uh, making space, holding space for the voices that I want to hear. I was looking around toward the beginning of all of this uh, extreme sort of pandemic moment that we're in. And I wanted to see who I wasn't hearing from, who I wasn't seeing in the 10,000 Zooms and IG Live conversations that were happening. I wasn't hearing from Black women, so created space to hear from them. Um, the conversation today is actually going to feature three Black women designers who are, you know, really just personally, because obviously I'm the one that curates this, so obviously it's from my perspective, but really doing interesting work and, and really uplifting um, various elements of Black heritage and really thinking about diasporic connection um, and also thinking about sustainability, thinking about um, fairly sourced materials, ethically sourced processes, um, and just really creating opportunities that are extending beyond just where they're specifically doing business. Um, so today we have Tisha Brown Kavanaugh, who's the founder and owner of Rebel Chic New York City. Uh, then we have Busayo Olupana, who is the founder of Busayo NYC. They can't see me yet. <laughs> they're waving at you. Know that they're waving. Know that there's enthusiasm. Um, and lastly, of course, Denise Ochui. She's dancing. You can't see it yet. You're going to see it eventually. Um, but <laughs> Denise is the founder of Dope Society, which is actually ready to wear clothing. She also has custom uh, designs, capsule collections that's released each season. And she's also doing events that feature live music and more. So they are all super well-rounded, dynamic women in their own right. And I'm so excited about this conversation that we're gonna have. As always, couple house things, housekeeping things. I love a lively chat. We love a lively chat. Say things in the chat. Also, please make sure when you're doing that, that you have it set to say to all panelists and attendees, not just to the panelists, because everybody won't be able to see what you're saying. Um, also, screenshots. We love screenshots. Everyone's going to put their uh, at, their handle on Instagram, et cetera, in the uh, chat box there. So we'll keep this conversation going beyond just here. Also, people keep asking, and I keep saying it, but I want to say it here so that people know. Um, all of the previous conversations will eventually be uploaded to YouTube. Right now, the first five are on YouTube on the 44 channel. Um, if you receive the emails, the link is in the email. If you receive like personal emails from me, the link is in my signature as well. Um, and I meant actually the guest, but thank you for your hashtag, Maria. Appreciate it. So we are going to get started. I'm super excited to have Tisha here. I have known Tisha for 11 years. Is At that least. true? That's a long yeah. time. Um, so New York City born and bred Tisha Brown Kavanaugh's career in fashion design and styling spans over 25 years. She is the founder and owner of Rebel Chic NYC. Rebel Chic's collection are delicately handcrafted from repurposed leather or vegetable tan leather, operating through zero waste echo philosophy by creating collections in small batches and making pieces for order. This minimizes waste by not overproducing, which contributes less to landfills. An appreciation for living a non-disposable lifestyle was instilled in her as a child and continues in the way that she works, whether using vintage clothing pieces when styling, upcycling materials for Rebel Chic, or composting at home. Tisha knows that a sustainable lifestyle isn't just for the privilege, but has deep roots in the Black community who were beguiled or shamed for a more holistic and sustainable lifestyle. Brown began her career in the early to mid 90s as a fashion intern 
for YSB Magazine. My clients over the years include Alessia Cara, Camp Lowe, Khalid, Most Def, Usher, as well as corporate clients like Condé Nast, ESPN, Hearst Publications, L'Oreal, MTV, Pepsi, and Visa. Super excited to have you here. I'm going to spotlight the video on you. I'm going to ask everyone else to mute themselves in the meantime, including myself. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. Hello, everyone. So thank you for the introduction. And I'm so honored to be here to be a part of your talks, um, Naima. Um, so just talking about, um, I guess, the way I started um, Rebel Chic was, uh, it was, it was from um, just not wanting to be wasteful. I had a gorgeous orange leather skirt that I wore all the time and put on a few pounds and ripped it. <laughs> so I couldn't, I didn't want to like, I'm like, I'm not going to throw it away. I, how do you really mend this leather that's, you know, that I clearly can't fit anyway. So like, how do I make use of this? And, um, and then I decided to make um, jewelry from it. Um, it was, uh, Something I guess the uh, my my craftiness <laughs> um, was learned through uh, my family, uh, who are all from um, South Carolina. Uh, growing up with a grandmother and aunts that uh, taught me how to quilt, taught me how to knit, um, how to sew. So um, so I've always had that creativity in me and. Um, and uh, like Naima said in my bio, I, uh, you know, I was always raised and, you know, like you, it, it's, I feel like it's something that um, sometimes Black people look at as a shameful past because we live in a society where everyone, you know, it's like we're, we live in a disposable lifestyle, you know, in our society where you don't want to be seen wearing something twice or you don't reuse something. You want to, you know, get something fast and get rid of it. Um, people don't really appreciate uh, craftsmanship anymore. And um, I really feel like with um, growing up with that uh, instilled in me, you know, where we, we did live, live a sustainable lifestyle, but it was, uh, more labeled as being poor or country, <laughs> where um, now we know, you know, hopefully more Black people can embrace and understand that that was, uh, that was probably our best, uh, you know, lifestyle, especially for the treatment of the earth and in our communities and our wellness, you know, um, even from uh, eating more like the farm to table, you know, and eating more fresh vegetables. But um, so for me, I was always conscious of, uh, of not uh, overusing and um, just being, uh, and to me, another thing with a uh, black style and our culture is that we've always been able to make nothing into something. So, you know, for me, it's like, yeah, take that, upcycle it, you know, like you're going to remix it, you're going to make it into something. So um, that's been, uh, that was pretty much, you know, how I felt about um, with that, uh, with starting Rebel Chic is that I wanted to lean into that, which at the beginning was a little hard, I have to say, because when you're in the fashion industry, and when you're listening to sales reps and buyers, you know, they want certain keywords that will sell to, you know, certain demographics and, you know, it has to be, especially dealing with leather. It's like, oh, fine leather from, you know, from Italy, like, you know, it has to be fine and luxury and yeah, it, you know, you can think of it as a luxury or you can think of it as a way to use the whole animal and not contributing to the um, to landfills and how to make use of everything that, you know, that we're given, that we're given from the earth. So, um, so it was a little challenging, I would say in the beginning with, um, 
trying to balance what um, what I wanted and then just kind of, you know, like being in a society and, uh, you know, like you're told what uh, success looks like. <laughs> you you're told you want to be in certain stores <laughs> you should be in you know like you should have a uh, all these things for a level of success so it's been interesting and glad to see that it's kind of come around to it where more people in the fashion industry are sustainable but um it's really more of a, a to me like a tagline than it's true sustainability Awesome. Do you want to share some of your work with us? Yes. Okay. Let's see. <laughs> like I did do a little practice on it. Um, so, so my signature collection that everyone knows me for are my Rebel Chic Drops and my, uh, and that's the drop style. And, uh, hold on, we don't see it. Oh, no. Okay. Can you see it now? It may be something about how you're sharing your screen. Uh, so if you, right. Google. Did it open in a new window? I think so. There we go. There we go. Oh, is there? Okay. Yeah. I think maybe I was in preview. Okay. So that's um, uh, my the Rebel Chic, my signature drop style. Um, and let's see. Can you see the hoops? Can you see the hoops? Or no? Not yet. Okay. okay. That it? Here we go. Okay, the hoops. So for me, the hoops and the well, so background to um, <clears throat> to creating um, the line. So I gave the backstory of you know when I um, tore my skirt and decided to make it. Before that, I um, just working as a wardrobe stylist in the industry. You always creating something for a job, whether you're creating something custom for a client or for a project. So, um, so one thing I was doing in the late 90s, uh, I was making a lot of uh, leather cuffs and um, chokers. And I had a little capsule collection that I sold at a Screaming Mimi's, a vintage shop in the village. And um, this so for me, like, you know, just even working with the leather, I already had experience working with leather. Um, but when I wanted to make um, something that uh, was, uh, when I was looking for inspiration for making several styles, especially for earrings. So my biggest pet peeve is I love like, you know, a nice statement earring, but um, sometimes, it, and it depends, but I personally like kind of like an understated statement earring. So the drops are usually my favorite and, um, uh, and the hoops, but the hoops were actually inspired by, um, by Miss, uh, Tina Turner. Let's see. Oops. Really? <laughs> yeah. It's her, um, uh, hold on a second. For context, I've had like four or five pairs of these in the last 10 years. So I'm like, oh, wow, really? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, wait, where am I? Minute long folder. Sorry. And then also distracted because my, my four year old just came in. He's like, I want to watch something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this is strange. I'm sorry. Didn't you say be prepared? I'm like, didn't you say be prepared? There we go. All right. New share. Hmm. Can you see it? 
Oh, wow. Yeah. So the hoop doesn't look, you know, exactly like that. But for me, you know, just being a, you know, a young black girl, there weren't many images that you could see and like, like really badass in the 80s. And of course, to me, Tina Turner and Mad Max like embody that like badass attitude and a little punk. So growing up in New York City, I just, you know, like I grew up on hip hop and R&B, but also, you know, rock and punk. And so for me, that she was my inspiration for the hoops. And also the, um, I'm not good at this. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. And then also the Fulani hoops, of course. Like that, yeah. I mean, that is uh, the comment I get most about my, um, about my hoop earrings is that it is reminiscent of, like it's a leather version of the, uh, can you see it? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, those are my inspirations for design. But, um, but then again, for me, um, my inspiration uh, with then just using, well, I, I took it on as a challenge to use leather as my main medium because I didn't find a lot of leather jewelry that wasn't um, really edgy or kind of like Southwestern boutique. Like I wanted to um, create something that was um, uh, made from typically unusual for um, sort of, I guess, high-end uh, jewelry. Even though I don't consider my jewelry high-end, but, um, but um, just uh, I, I I wanted to challenge myself with using leather, so that's been um, a part of my process or my inspiration for my collection. And then I wanted to share also um, different ways that I've been using leather, which has been um, so with those two designs, they're standalone leather pieces. But then um, just really inspired by um, sheathing and covering things with leather. So it's a little unexpected that people will see that, oh, that's a colorful, you know, like, oh, that's, what's this black piece of jewelry? And then they touch it and they feel it and they see that, oh, it's leather. So these are some pieces. This is a, a brooch that I make, which is, sorry, can you see it? Um, is a lion's head and um and actually like coming up with that design um like i want it to look like it was a part of the leather which was very reminiscent of a lot of the leather artisan work you see at a lot of african street festivals and stuff so for me that was the um it was kind of like the secondary uh, inspiration. Because once I thought of it, and I was like, oh yeah, like the mask that people hang on their wall. So, uh, so it was like that. So for me, any with the brooches, I wanted to kind of like just be a part of the leather that it's, it's like this piece is, um, something's being formed out of the leather. And now I am, uh, so in, in that vein, I've been working on more pieces, um, wrapping more leather pieces. Uh, and my uh, inspiration now has been, um, well, which is always my inspiration. I feel like um, being close to the ocean and the sea is always inspirational for me. So, and it, it's cleansing, it's renewing. Um, so. I started out uh, some years ago, I had a few pieces that um, from seashells that I wrapped in leather. I made some necklaces. So now I'm working on expanding the collection uh, to make it more of a whole collection. So these are some seashell pieces that I have. And I am also, working on some oops, cowrie shells 
to make pieces. And let's see. And then these are just some more pieces that um, that I've made with that same process of wrapping pieces in leather. So I have uh, like a heart brooch and um, arrowhead uh, that arrowheads that I've turned into necklaces and uh, wrapped crucifix and which are part of I have. Um, uh, a sacred hearts collection, I call it, <laughs> which is all kind of like religious inspired um, and I guess Catholic and Christian inspired more so. Um, then a warrior collection, which uh, includes the, the lion head, but um, has the arrowheads and the, the skulls. Like, I don't know if you can see. And the feathers. So... Um, which was uh, strongly influenced um, just by uh, like First Nations people in America. So um, yeah, so that's it. Any questions? <laughs> awesome. Um, thank you so much, Tish. Appreciate you being here and you sharing so much with us. Um, also, just a note for everyone, we do accept questions from you so please put your questions in the little q a box which you should see toward the bottom of your screen um and next we have wusayo are you ready you good okay um so i'm just gonna introduce her read her bio really quickly wusayo michelle olupana is a visionary designer and attorney highlighting traditional nigerian culture through fashion she has built her brand Busayo NYC around her belief in, women, in the power of color to communicate the dynamism, personality, and nuances of the individual. Her upbringing in Nigeria is inextricably linked to her design aesthetic and process. Through the expert processes through which she makes her work, she wanted to continue to explore traditional textile and cultural production techniques from Nigeria and the ways in which they inform the present. So I'm super excited to have you here. We haven't known each other a super long time, but I'm excited and I was super excited when I met you and you're also indulging me in like, I want that color, can you make that? You, and you do it for me every time. So thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna ask you to unmute yourself. I'm gonna mute myself and give you the spotlight. Yeah. yeah. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me. Um, what an honor, pleasure, joy um, to participate in this conversation. I'm trying to find the right light. I have light coming all over the place, so I hope you guys can see okay. Um, we met, uh, yeah, not too long ago. It was two, two Decembers ago at PRISM, which is like Black Fabulous Art Fair in Miami. And um, it was just, it was, it's an incredible thing, and it makes me so sad because I, I don't think it's going to happen this year. Um, but um, so I'm Busayo. Um, I actually, my career is interesting in that I started as an attorney. I am the child of Nigerian immigrants and it was like, you know, we came here. So like, you know, we have a doctor, we have lawyers, you know, my brother has an MBA. Like we were all kind of like in these very traditional industries, but I knew that in my spirit, in my gut, in terms of what I was passionate about, um, law certainly wasn't it. Um, I still practice law. We can talk about that, but like, you know, for me around 2011, you know, I would always go home to Nigeria. I started going back. We came in 1991 and I went back on my first trip in 2002. And I would make things from Nigeria and I would wear it because it was really important to me that, you know, my, my physical presentation showed that history, that tradition and showed the culture that I had come from. And so I would make things just for myself. And it was mostly Ankara wax print, which we can talk about, you know, that was sort of like what I grew up wearing and that's what I would make. And I would just wear it around and people would like it and people commented on it and, and more and more. I, I also wanted things I could wear to the law firm and to the workplace. That was like really important to me to be able to make things that I could wear to this fancy white shoe, you know, financial district law firm. So I would make like very simple dresses out of Ankara, but it was always like the tamer prints, you know, that would work in that space. Um, and then people started asking where they were from and, you know, where did you get them from? And all of a sudden I think Spirit around 2011, 2012 
spirit really began telling me like this is something I, I I just felt like I had to do it and I really ignored it and I think if I knew everything it took to create a fashion business I'm not sure I would have done it like at the time you know because at the time it's like I'm just gonna start a fashion line and I remember you know talking to one of my colleagues at the law firm at the time and you know having the strong desire to create this thing but not knowing how to do it and he said to me um he was he's a hustler Jamaican cat and he goes uh, how did you become a lawyer? And I was like, well, I read books and I studied. And then he got off out of my office and he left. And I was like, that's so rude. But like, I had given myself the answer for how to do this, right? And that's literally what happened. I, I got books. I started, you know, studying in terms of like, what does it actually mean to create a clothing line and bring something to the marketplace? Um, <laughs> in, a, in a bit, in a bit, yeah. Um, anyway, so like, what is it going to take to bring to bring something to the market? And it's, I knew it was going to be a lot of work. And I, so I just started going back to Nigeria. I started apprenticing with um, folks that, my first two collections were primarily wax print. Um, and as I just became immersed in that space and kind of knew, understood the history of wax print and really knows that, you know, I call it like the most successful colonial project of all time, right? Um, and I, I still wear it, but I just, I think it's important to wear it with some consciousness. We can talk about that later. Um, the line slowly moved away from wax print. And then I think around 2014, um, I started learning Adire myself, which is the tradition, A-D-I-R-E, which means to tie and dye in Yoruba, which is uh, my, my uh, tribal um, background and culture. And um, I started learning how to, to do Adire work and started apprenticing with, um, with artisans who do Adire. And then the line just, it just moved to that because that was just so much more interesting and so much more dynamic for me. Um, and then I would say in the last three or four years, we've really evolved. So we do primarily women. Um, we do do some men's uh, work. I'm still figuring out what men like it's in terms of fashion. Well, in terms of other things too, but in terms of fashion, like it's like, you know, it's like really hard. Like women's wear is super easy, but men's wear is a whole nother thing, you know? Um, so we have a few men's pieces, but really I focus on women's wear. I love dressing women. I love the opportunity to interact with so many incredible people that this work has brought me. Um, and then I think in the last three or four years, as I go home, so I go home twice a year to create the collection. And then I started sort of the work I was doing for myself was how do we ensure that this cultural practices continue? How do we ensure that across the diaspora, we're having conversations between the black folks that were kidnapped and taken away who've lived in, in the West, right? And those of us in, on the continent. And for me, to me, that, that connection and that diasporic conversation is so critical to the survival of black people like everywhere. So like the notion that the things that we're going through in Lagos and in Nigeria are not that, you know, the, the, that, that, that trauma that we're all suffering from and the difficulties, to me, those conversations really speak to each other. And so through my work, and I think this has been the last three years, really figuring out, sorry, I live in Brooklyn, um, uh, really figuring out how to have that conversation. And then what that did for my work was, okay, I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly trying to investigate my own curiosities about Yoruba culture, even though I grew, that's what I grew up in. Like there's so much, you know, we just, we were really lucky. We spoke Yoruba at home. My father's a religious studies professor, but so many other uh, Nigerian kids didn't have that. It was like, sweet, they, you know, some people grew up in Nigeria and only speak English. They don't speak Yoruba. So as I investigated my cultural curiosities and was trying to learn more about our culture, it really just gave an opportunity to share it with an audience. So the storytelling that I started doing around hair, if you go a lot on the Instagram, people are like, what kind of, what is this a clothing? Like you have a clothing brand, is it a hair site? What is this? It's really because to me, I, I think all those things are the same. I think style speaks from what's on your head to what's on your body. But I re it was really important to me that like, I, I wanna share all of that with my audience. And so, a lot of the work around hair, around cultural traditions, um, artisan traditions outside of textile making, like woodworking, all that stuff, you'll see a lot of that content. Um, and that's been sort of in the last three or four years is really developing this passion for storytelling and how do I share the brilliance and amazingness of our culture 
beyond just clothes. I mean, clothes are the main thing. I love them. I love making them. So we make all of our textiles like this textile. I'll just stand up a little bit. Like this is um, this is all made by hand, right? Like this is all batik made by hand. And um, so to, to start with white fabric and then design and then change and manipulate, like what a blessing, what a joy, like it's so fun. Um, and so let me share some of my work with you guys. Um, I really hope I don't screw this up. Um, and I don't have everything organized in neat collections, unfortunately, but no uh, hold on, where is the, this is Take the time. Okay, there we go. Can you guys see it? Uh, yeah, did you share your screen? Oh, wait, did I not do that? Hold on one second. I've been learning how to do this. I thought I was going to be prepared. Share screen. Uh, so there should be a little... Yeah, I see Cheryl Windows. It's in my, my internet uh, explorer. Uh, shoot. You should be able to... Um, I'm trying to share... Part. Share with on your desktop, or you share okay. Safari. Okay, or so I just. Browser. Oh, let me see. So I've. Let me go to go to what I need. Want to share and then share screen if it's if it's on the desktop. Yes, I would open it up first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, I thought I was practicing while uh, you guys were talking earlier, but obviously I did not succeed. Okay. It's all video. Uh, Why is this not working? Um, so, babe, I may need outside assistance. Wait, let me do this again. Why is this not working? Sorry, guys. You totally told us to be prepared for this, and I was. I have some in here. They're just not, I just only have a few things. I don't, okay, so I'll just show you guys. This, this makes me sad. I'll see if I can figure it out. Um, can you guys see this? Yes. Sorry, this is like a messy folder, but it does not have nearly, has my James Baldwin class stuff, which is not what I want to show you. We can start with this while I figure out. Um, Yes, I'm obsessed with this dress. Please start. With we can start with this one um, while I figure out how to see, show you guys more images. So everybody can see this? Not yet. Okay. No? We're just seeing like the, the uh, sort of... No? That it's working. We don't... Is the picture open for you? Yeah. Oh. Uh, make, make sure, click on a new share. Because we okay. see all your files. Oh, I, I see. think at the okay. top it says new share and then it'll oh, show God, the This image. is so embarrassing. I don't think I have anything. It's dirty. really okay. It's <laughs> not. <laughs> it's literally not the worst thing that could be happening. It's fine. Can you see this? Babe, I need help. Okay, I think this works. Yeah? Yes, no. yes, okay, yes. Okay, finally. Okay. Oh, that was exhausting. Okay. So I want to show you guys more things, but we'll start with this one. So this is a really good, um, this is a really good kind of atypical um, ajure piece, but I can, I'm going to share it with you like the process of understanding what happened here. So to create, think about a white plain canvas, which is what we always start with. And what I like about this piece is that this piece is a combination of techniques, right? So you do, you have tie-dye and you have batiking in the same garment. So essentially we take and, and even the, so this is actually one fabric, but you can see that, um, and so it was set in a little, so the first level went, let's say we have it plain, the first level was actually the white, right? And then the next level after that, the white ones, the white little ones was like the top of the fabric. Then the pink little ones was the next one. And then the yellow little ones are at the, as at the, is at the uh, third level. So essentially when we try to create this fabric, we divide it in half and we do what's called like, um, it's called step muti in um, Wolof, um, I'm sorry, in um, Mandinga. So a lot of the people I work with are from Gam the Gambia, the Gambian immigrants to Nigeria. And so they have a method to that line where you dye one color, you dye one color, you have one color, that's called step muti in Mandinga. 
Um, so that's what we did with the white, the yellow, and the pink. And then for the, the big part that you see at the bottom, we essentially do a tie-dye for that portion of the, of, the, of the fabric and dip, we tie it into a triangle and we dip each piece, each end of it into yellow, white, and pink so that you have that uh, combination of fabrics close to each other. So now you have a fabric that has lines across with the white, with the yellow, and the pink. And then you have the bottom of the fabric has this mixture of all three together. And then we go over it with a batik, with, a, with wax. And then the final process is we dye it one more time black, and then we remove all the wax that we put on top of it. So it's to begin to really create and understand like what's possible, right? I really had to spend time learning it myself, right? Because, you know, this, this, this fabric and the way it's all come together is a result of like, you know, eight years of doing this work. This is not something I could have done in my first like two or three seasons because you begin to see how you can put techniques together and combine them to create something like this. So I always want, I don't want our fabrics to ever just be like the same thing that everybody has and sees. So like, it's always like, how can we do this, you know, differently? How can we do this in a more interesting way? So I really love this piece because it's both tie and dye. Most of our fabrics are usually tie or dye or batik, but this one I like because it's a combination. Um, now I'm scared to go back, but let me, I want to give you guys another example. Uh, let's see. So I taught this James Baldwin class this week. That's why you guys see James Baldwin and all that stuff in my, in my, uh, we love Baldwin. It's all good. He's, he's something. If you're not a Baldwin, fan, please do yourself a favor and go dig out his books right now because we all need it with everything that's going on. We need him more than ever. Um, let me find the other one. So I'm sorry, you guys. I'm not going to get to show you the fun part. Stop that apologizing, please. I really wanted to show you guys that purple one. You will. Yeah, but I'm going to, I'll dig it out while. Denicio is talking. Hi, Denicio. <laughs> um, Actually, while you're doing that, um, maybe I will share um, something. If you want to um, unshare your screen, I'll just um, bump you off here. OK. Um, so. Uh, I'm going to mute you till you find your footing there. Um, I'm going to share something. Uh, so I did a panel yesterday and um, among the prepared slides, I was thinking about that the panel was called who represents whom and it was about documentary photography and like who is capable of from a photography standpoint, because you know, like for the history of that medium, it's long been a thing where it's always white people picturing others. Um, so the conversation about that right now is like, how do we push against that? How do we move forward? How can white photographers even possibly do that, but do it ethically, do it responsibly, do it in ways that don't subsume and assume that they have all the information about the cultures that they're trying to represent. Um, and so, Oops, wrong thing. Boom. Oops. So that's all. I think that's something we can all reflect on for the moment. This is from um, a speech that Baldwin did in 1962. And I think this applies to every sort of way of you being an artist. Um, so I'll read this in case people can't see it. You can only take if you're prepared to give and giving is not an investment. It is not a day at the bargain counter. It is a total risk of everything of you and who you think you are and who you think you'd like to be, where you think you'd like to go and everything and this forever, forever. So I think, um, just in, and actually, I think we'll come back to that in terms of how we're going to frame the conversation that we have together in a few minutes. Um, so, Busayo, how are you doing? Are you feeling closer to? I can't hear you. You're muted. I made, I made some progress. I can show you guys a couple more things. 
Okay, cool. Right. So I'm going to put the spotlight back on you. So this one, can you guys see this? Oh, new share. Can you see this? Oh, you want a yes, a verbal yes, yes. <laughs> yes, okay, cool. Um, so this piece is, um, so a couple things that are happening here. This is my, so I want to show you guys this one because this is my hair. My hair, when I go home, is always like this. And this style is called Iron Kiko. And um, in 2017, just off the top, like randomly, we were preparing for a shoot. I wanted to begin to introduce traditional hair, the way that we, some of the ways that we traditionally make hair into the work and the styling of the, of the models. And so we did this short little video that was just preparing for a shoot and it just took on a life of its own and, and went viral. Um, and was really an opportunity for people to just ask questions about this hairstyle that they hadn't quite seen before. Um, so this style I'm wearing here is called um, Eco Bridge, um, and it's basically like the sides are like mohawked down, and then the middle is like this bridge. And essentially, the, when the style came out, we name everything, right, uh, in Yoruba tradition. And so the style came out, um, people just, it reminded them of this bridge in Lagos, and so that's what they called, that's what they called the style. And this particular print I love because um, this is sort of like, when you look at Adira going back to its beginnings, um, this, 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 this motif is really what a lot of traditional Adira pieces look like. They were indigo, so they were much darker than this. Um, and these ones are much more like, we don't, we don't, they don't have particular meanings, like the motifs that we use. Uh, so we just, you know, it's just artistic interpretation, but traditionally the motifs that would be drawn into these boxes would have particular meaning and cultural meaning. So a bird has a meaning, a lizard has a meaning. And so you would see the integration of some artistic, you know, artistic drawings, but you would also see particular motifs that communicate particular ideas um, that the artist wants to ex express, right? So um, I really love this piece because, and we do a lot, if you look at our work, we do a lot with this, um, with the, we do a lot with this uh, motif. Um, Let's see, let me go back to pictures. Um, one second. Um, I'm going to share this one with you guys. Um, this is some of our attempts at menswear. <laughs> I actually really love this piece. It, it's one of my favorites. It's coming up. I mean, uh, I would wear that. So yeah, it's fun, right? It's um, it's a, uh, it's a drip. I wanted to to create fabric where it was just like paint, like if you poured paint on a wall and it dripped down, um, what that would look like, and that was really that's that's what that's what inspired this one. And it's a drip. You see how it works. You see. Yeah, and we do it. I mean, we do it in different colors, and I'm really playing with like how we can combine like different different um, different. You always have to think about relationships of color, though. Oh, no. Is it open for you? Because it's not open for us. Oh, really? Uh, one second. Let me see. I think what you're doing is that you're you're sharing like this specific screen rather than yeah. sharing the whole screen which is why oh. i'm seeing when you're opening images and you know what's so funny i had a zoom training last week to work on this exact issue <laughs> and obviously i did not learn um it was driving me crazy is that what i want to show you guys is actually in uh it's an uh internet explorer and for whatever reason i can't it's not showing up in the zoom in the options you know Anyway, it's fine. Do you fine. have Explorer open right now? Yeah, I do. I have it open at my the bottom, like Google Drive, and it has all these images inside. Hmm. And it's open on my screen. Like right now, I'm looking at it. I want to show you guys. Okay, wait. So you should just start a new share, right? Okay. Um, if you press new share, it should allow you to open whatever you have open. Oh, Bukola said Internet Explorer may not be compatible. Uh, that's why. Okay, this is what I'll do. Maybe move to Denisio. I'll work on getting it open in Chrome. And then if there's time, I'd love to share it with people. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's Thank you. Said, um, I'm going to ask you to mute yourself. Yep. Oh. 
All right. Denicio, is you ready? You ready. Denicio Truitt is a Liberian American visual artist, designer, and dressmaker based in New Orleans. She is also the founder and owner of Dope Society, a streetwear brand featuring her original artwork. Dope Society's clothing has been featured in both television and film, including Queen Sugar, See You Yesterday, as well as the short film Suitable. Currently, Denicio's design focuses on bespoke fashion with an emphasis on stage performance, weddings, and formal events. She has also invested in creating custom capsule wardrobes and uniforms for creative workers. Her own capsule collections are available in short runs. Of her vision for design, she writes, my aim is to make garments that celebrate and exalt the human body in its infinite forms with an emphasis on the feminine. I make clothing for individuals who want to feel beautiful and perhaps a little dangerous. I'm here for that, I'm into it. I'm going to ask you to unmute yourself. I'm going to spotlight your video. All right. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I was getting my life with these presentations. I forgot I had to present myself. <laughs> Um, thank you, Nyama, for having me here. It's an honor to be in such like amazing company with y'all, Tisha Busayo. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm Denicio. I'm a designer. Um, I kind of wanted to talk briefly about the two main things that feed me currently, which is uh, Dope Society, my streetwear brand, and then also my custom designs and kind of take you through how all of that came to be. Um, so I'm going to try this share screen thing. I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully it works. It'll uh, work. The more you all approach it with that attitude. I know. Work. I know. That's like horrible. Um, screen. Oh, boy. Um, Lord. Or alternatively, if you all want to just send me whatever you want to share, I can do that too. Yeah, could I could I possibly just do that? Yes, you may. Okay. Um so I will let's see. I'm gonna send it to you real quick. Is it are you sending me like a File via Google Drive or uh, uh, it's a it's a keynote. Do you you have a yeah? I'm on a Mac. So okay, that's cool. It's a keynote presentation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, oh, it's kind of big. Sorry. <laughs> um. I can just, I guess I could just talk <laughs> a little bit about. Let's just could. talk for now. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy, uh, technology. Um, well, I'm not a technology buff, as you can see. <laughs> um, I started out as an artist, um, formerly with like painting, um, uh, specifically portraiture in college. I studied creative writing and studio art. Um, similar to Busayo, I come from a very African family that had very, you know, specific expectations of what I was going to do uh, when I went to college. And I was always this, this very artsy kind of creative kid. Um, and so that's always kind of been in my wheelhouse. Um, a lot of the designs that I do specifically for Dope Society revolve around uh, masks. Um, I grew up with uh, traditional African art in the household. My mother is Liberian. My father is um, from New uh, North Carolina, uh, Black American. And so growing up in the household, we also, we always had like a plethora of like traditional African art, masks, fetish statues, whatnot. That's just kind of what I grew up with. And um, I've always just kind of had this affinity for this art. Um, and when I graduated from college, I had this um, kind of fantasy of becoming an art you know, a full-time artist, like that's what I wanted to do, uh, mostly painting. And I used uh, specifically the Dan mask in a lot of my early kind of portraiture work. Um, eventually I kind of gave up on that dream for a little while, uh, entered the workforce, had a nine to five job for about seven years. Um, and when that became 
uh, suffocating and non-fulfilling to me, I decided to try to resume this idea of working as a full-time creative. Um, that's when Doxiety came to play. Um, I took uh, an image that I had of a, of a specific um, West African mask, the Dan mask, which is from the Dan tribe of Liberia. And I started playing around with it in Photoshop, which is what some of the images that I wanted to show you. Um, in this, what I call, I guess, digital collage for, you know, lack of a better term, um, this idea of taking different elements and creating a whole new image with them and taking, you know, something that is traditional and ancient and putting it within a modern framework and seeing what it does or if the meaning changes at all um, was my main goal at the point at that time. Um, and in doing that and working with that and coming up with these kind of digital designs, um, I thought about a way of kind of not necessarily transmuting my artwork, but maybe uh, a different vehicle to like showcase my artwork and sell my artwork that might be more accessible to people. And so I started thinking about t-shirt designs and graphic t-shirts, which were around 2013, were kind of coming into like Vogue and being more, um, being more seen on the fashion, in the fashion world. Um, so I launched Oak Society in 2013 with four designs, um, four t-shirt designs uh, made by me. And the reception was like pretty good, which I was really surprised by. Um, people really kind of connected to the designs in a way that I wasn't expecting. Um, and from then, from there branched uh, different designs using fetish statues. I actually recently, like two years ago, started selling art prints of the, you know, the original artwork, which kind of feels full circle to me. Um, so like not just selling clothing, um, but also selling my actual artwork, which feels really wonderful. Um, and while I was doing that, I was also designing and doing custom work specifically for uh, musicians and artists. Um, I love doing stage design because I love doing, I love drama. I love making very dramatic things. I love reveals and transformations and things like that. Um, so I was doing a lot of that while I was doing uh, Dope Society, but kind of not really publicly kind of announcing it. It was more of a word of mouth kind of thing. And so recently I launched my own website, denisiotruitt.com, um, which has been an offering of like my custom design work. Um, so for bridal, for formal, for whatever, if you just want to dress because you want to look cute. Um, and I also do these capsule collections specifically with um, a lot of mud cloth, which has been like my first, um, my first capsule collection, um, both traditional and like non-traditional mud cloth. Um, oh, great. <laughs> the shared screen. Thank you so much. Um, so let's see. So yeah, the first slide is the mask that I was talking about. Um, the Dan mask. It's uh, meant to be a non-binary, like gender neutral form of ideal beauty uh, within the Dan tribe. Um, and this is kind of the foundation of most of the early designs of Dope Society. Um, so then if you want to go to the next slide, this was prior to Dope Society, I was using this mask as a study for these paintings that I was doing. Um, and this specific painting was part of a series that I was doing um, of uh, women characters in traditional Liberian folklore stories. Um, and so all of their faces um, were basically used, painted with a mask on it. Um, and then next slide, please. It, all right, so this is the, the first design I was talking about, um, my Fulani print, which has been by far the top seller of, out of all of my t-shirts, uh, art prints, all of that. Um, and this was formed um, as a digital collage um, when I was using Photoshop and experimenting with it and wanting to take kind of modern um, aesthetics and applying them to traditional African art. Um, so I had a pair of Fulani earrings that I had. I took a photograph of those and, you know, erased all around it, added it to the mask. I wrapped my head in a turban, took a picture, erased that, like, you know, paste it on. Um, and what I found surprisingly was that this work was just as much, if not more fulfilling to me um, as the painting that I was doing as like my kind of fine art background. It felt, I don't know, it felt more real to me and maybe kind of in the literal sense of like using real elements and placing them together to create this new image. Um, 
but I just, I really felt fed by this idea of collage work. Um, and that's pretty much where I've been with my artwork, artwork um, ever since. Um, and then, okay, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the design on a t-shirt. This is basically classic Dope Society. Um, literally one of the first designs that I came out with and seven years later, seven, yeah, seven years later, um, it's still selling and that feels really good. Um, it feels amazing to be able to create work and see it out in the world and see people interact with it and um, interpret it in ways that I didn't necessarily expect, but I, I love that. I love the idea of art being communal rather than just, you know, this kind of thing that's meant to be viewed or, you know, put on a wall and whatever your reaction to it is your reaction. Um, uh, what's the next slide? <laughs> Um, okay, so with my custom design work, um, I just wanted to like um, show some of my biggest inspirations, um, which is three women, these two women, Anne Lowe uh, and Zelda Wynn Valdez, both dressmakers, designers, prolific designers. Um, Anne Lowe actually designed uh, Jacqueline Kennedy's wedding dress and Zelda Wynn Valdez, one of her most uh, famous uh, uh, things that she did was uh, uh, come up with the Playboy Bunny costume. Um, but I just, with my custom design work, I really wanted to kind of get back to this idea of being a dressmaker and making custom clothes and making things for specific bodies rather than mass producing and, you know, having these kind of very specific sizes, sizing. Um, I just really wanted to get back to a more kind of intimate relationship with customers um, that I wasn't necessarily getting with Dope Society. Um, and it's not a negative, a matter of a negative or positive thing. I just really wanted to, I don't know, I was being called to do more intimate work with people on a kind of more one-on-one -on -one consultation basis. And so um, earlier this year, I launched DeniseoTruitt.com, which is where all this stuff is housed. And then the next slide is uh, one of my biggest inspirations, which is my grandmother, uh, Priscilla Enicio Sae. I'm named after her. Um, she was also a seamstress and a dressmaker and owned her own boutique in Liberia. And she's the ancestor that I talk to the most. And she's been the one kind of guiding me towards the work that I'm doing now. Um, am I doing okay on time? There was, okay, good. Okay, so real quick, I wanna go through kind of a quick process of like what my custom design work looks like because I thought it might be kind of interesting. Um, so first, the, the next slide, it starts with a sketch. This is a sketch that I did um, for a Grammy dress uh, this year. I did a dress for uh, Tank from Tank and the Bangas. Um, Ah, you know her. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was, I was excited and terrified because this was I've I've done a few Grammy dresses before, but she was like nominated, so I knew she was gonna like be like on screen and possibly on the stage. So I was yeah, but um, it starts with a sketch. I work really well with kind of abstract ideas more so than I do with like, hey, here's this dress Beyonce wore, like make me this. Um, I work really well with just kind of like feelings, moods, like you give me a picture of a thunderstorm over the Grand Canyon and I'm like, I got you. Like, I know exactly what that means. Like, I'm gonna I'm make you a thunderstorm dress. Um, yeah, so we start out with like basic sketches. I usually do three to four different sketches. We kind of take from some, take a little bit from here, there, um, keep doing sketches until we feel, we both feel good, me and the client feels good with what's, what's happening. Um, and then from there, next slide, we um, work on color schemes. And in this instance, we decided to uh, settle on a powder blue, kind of baby blue hue, which um, was really, really fun because Tank had never worn this color before. And she had had an album that came out called The Green Balloon. And so that whole previous year, 2019, she was wearing green all the time. And she was so sick of green. And when I asked her what color she wanted to do, she was like, anything but green. Um, so we wanted to go with an unexpected color. Um, funnily enough, I had been watching a lot of like old musical shows and I, specifically the Brandy Cinderella. I was watching that a whole lot. And so there's a little bit of influence in that. Um, and kind of keeping similar with kind of Tank's own story, um, felt very kind of Cinderella-ish and almost like fairy tale-like and magical. 
Um, so we went with this. We were going to do a brocade uh, panel underneath um, the peplum. Uh, that changed a little bit, as you'll see um, in the in the next couple slides. Um, from there, I do what's called a muslin, which is a basic um, first draft version of a dress. Um, it helps save time. It helps you from messing up your good expensive fabric you just bought. Um, and it also helps me create a pattern. I usually, I basically uh, cut the pattern from this. Um, I uh, typically drape it onto a dress form, which you'll see in the next slide. Um, and from there, I'll write myself little notes, um, you know, take in what needs to be taken in, let out. Um, the dress forms that I use are completely custom. I've I have the slip cover basically that I um, stuff various stuffing in in strategic places based on the person's measurements. So my dress forms are always the exact size that the person is. Um, and that helps a lot. That just that cuts down on time and it makes sure that the fit is right. Um, so in the next side, you'll see me working and looking super stressed out. Um, I did this whole thing over Christmas break in my in-laws basement. And that was really fun. They were really kind for letting me use the space. Um, but as you can see, there's a lot more brocade than was in the sketch. And that happened on the fly because it was just such beautiful fabric. And I felt really, I just couldn't cover it all up. I just couldn't. And a lot of times, like with my design work that happens, there's a lot of pivoting. And it's, for the most part, it's served me well. And usually, you know, I've been lucky to have customers that are just kind of the same way with me and just kind of easygoing and just like understanding. Um, so yeah, change to that. And then the finished product is on the next slide. Um, yeah, that's them at the Grammys. And um, it was a really, it was a really surreal experience to see my work like on live TV. Um, Cause you know, I had some shirts and stuff in um, some movies and stuff, but this was like, this is a whole other feeling. Um, there's a lot of like custom things that went on. Um, I like to do a lot of Easter egg things. So she had one single that was uh, entitled Ants. And so I found these like little gold ant um, kind of, uh, not statues, but just little charms basically. And there, you can't really see it that well in this picture, but they're kind of strategically placed like crawling up the peplums. And it's not necessarily an element that anybody photography would see or if you would even see like up close if you weren't looking for it, but it's something that she knew was there. And with my design work, that's really important to me to always have these kind of little special elements um, that is there for, specifically for the wearer. Um, and then let's see, what's the next slide? Oh, yeah. So in addition to like my custom work that I do and my stage performance stuff, I've also been releasing these very small, intimate capsule collections I've been really trying to use natural fabrics, um, handmade fabrics. Um, this capsule collection, I was using a lot of mud cloth and indigo cloth specifically from Mali. Um, I have a supplier in New York that's just the bomb diggity. And yeah, I've really, I've really been into doing these like small capsule collections and I offer like maybe one to, one to four pieces uh, per, per item, per, uh, design. Um, it's been a lot, it's been a lot more for this one because people have really been demanding stuff, which has been wonderful, but it's been, it's been a lot. <laughs> um, and I try to treat this very similarly to like my custom design work in that I ask for measurements. If you don't know how to measure, I can send you a measuring kit. We can hop on a uh, zoom or a FaceTime and I can show you how to do that. Um, I sew in hand tags, like, uh, you know, hand embroidered tags with people's names on them. Um, I like to make it a really intimate, personal, kind of wonderful experience because I think that's an experience that we as Black women um, don't get to have a lot. And I think it's kind of interesting that all of this kind of formed itself at this specific time during the pandemic and all of this crazy stuff that's going on because I just feel like I've learned that like my my life's work is to make women feel good and make black women feel good, especially. And I just want to, I want to continue that work. And I think that's what drives me the most is this idea of making black women feel good and beautiful. And yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> 
Oh, yeah. So this is an example, too, um, of like what the Paganique looks like. I do handmade notes. Um, there's the hand embroidered uh, tag that I do. Um, yeah, I just want to make it, I want to make it special for us, you know? So uh, that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you, Niyama, so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, there we go. Everybody unmute yourself. Yeah. Um, Busayo, did you send me something or? I sent you a link. Did you see it in the chat? I, oh, in the chat. Yeah. So for some reason, when I use Keynote, I can't see anything else that's happening. Oh, okay. Um, so let me send, should I send an email? Wait, let me uh, see if I can. It's just a link to a Google Drive. I can't really scroll up. It I can send an email too. One second. Thank you. You, will you be able to open an email? Yeah. Or you could even share it, like if it's a folder, just share it via um, Google Drive. So I already have oh, it. Open, yeah, so got it. Okay. Can do that. Just be in the shared with me and I can just open it up and yeah, move the, on with whatever. Cool. So one of the things, um, I mean, Denicio, your sort of ending line just then is a good place. Um, I've never asked you this. Tisha, but I wonder about it. Um, also, just just like a, this is, I'm not nitpicky, but I just want to also clarify everyone's like names, the, con the correct pronunciation of everyone's names. In my brain, I'm always like, is this right? <laughs> it happens to me all the time. I'm like, is this right? Yeah. So you start, Tisha, is that right? I'm always like, is that it's, wrong? It's Tisha. Tisha. My full name that. is not Tisha. Wow. So Tish, Tisha. Wow. Yeah. I've known you so long and I never knew that. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, a lot of people call, it's not so far off. Call me Tasha. I will definitely correct you. But <laughs> I'm like, Tisha. I'm like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay, I got it. <laughs> so Wait, mine so is uh, Uluwa Busayo. Uh, Busayo. Like Busayo, but most Nigerians truncate the names. You, it's, a, it's a very normal, like everybody cuts it off. So every, my parents call me Busayo, um, means brings joy. But Uluwa Busayo means God added our joy. It's like a second child's name. Like we were happy. And then, again? God. I said, it, it means God added to our joy. It's like a second child name. Like we already had one and then you came and God added to our joy. So Yoruba culture, you are named around what, what's happening when you showed up, what's going on. So if you're a twin, there's a particular name. If you come after an ancestor passes. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, but Busayo, um, I'm, I'm pretty low-key. But as long as you get some version of it, right? <laughs> Share the... It's coming right now to your okay. email. Um, so it's funny that you bring this up because I've actually recently over the past few years have been a little more stringent in how I, how I pronounce my name because I tend to mispronounce my name um, mm -hmm. in an effort to make it easier for people. No. And I think sometimes, pe yeah, it's, 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 it's not good. Sure. <laughs> so I'm getting better at it. So the actual way that you pronounce my name is Denicio. Um, Denicio. Denicio, which is what I <laughs> <laughs> used to say, but it's Denisio. Um, I'm named after my grandmother whose name was Enisio, and it means nothing lasts forever um, in uh, their tribal language, which is Cru. So, yeah. Denisio. Is that right? Denisio. 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 So beautiful. So I always it thought it was like three syllables instead of um, four, you know, instead of Denisio, it's like Denisio. 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 <laughs> Yes. <laughs> um, and my name is pronounced Nyama. 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 Um, okay, you said you sent it. I shared it with you in, in email. I'm refreshing. Okay, good. Uh, yeah. Okay. Boom, we got a folder. All right, so I'm going to. So it's a bunch of pictures. So, 
start, there's this, I think the second picture is the purple gaily. Yeah, that one, start with that. Wow. Um, Do you want it bigger somehow? Uh, yeah, if possible. But I'll take this. Oops, oops. Okay, that's perfect. So this, um, I wanted to start with this one because, um, well, the location where we are at. So I also try to bring people along to Nigeria with me. So um, outside of, there's a forest outside of the Ocean Shrine in Oshogo. So it's like um, the shrine and then, Osho, uh, you know, Oshogo is the home of Oshun, the goddess, the river. And there's this forest that's like on the other, that's sort of an extension of the shrine and goes, you know, and I, it's just the place I love to go oh, to. Right? What'd you say? The grove. Yeah, it's a grove, exactly. And so there's this crazy bamboo shoots, like these bamboo trees that are just insane. And um, so I just really wanted to capture and bring people to that place. Um, and this is a purple version of the, that blue that I showed people before. And um, this one is doing really well right now. All of a sudden, it's like, it's been around for a minute, but now people have found it. And then let's see, um, we can skip like three or four slides and then I will tell you when to stop. Just keep going. Um, Maybe just tell me. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. So go down. Go down. Um, the, the, oh yeah, this one. That's a good one. This one? Yeah. This is from spring. This hasn't actually come out yet. This is, um, so this is like mixing pranks. This is what I'm like, my brain is obsessed with now. Like how do we like mix and combine and just throw prints at each other and clash. Just things that, you know, we're so restricted in terms of like how colors are supposed to fit together. So this is a combination of three fabrics. Um, and the, the, uh, the middle one that has, it's like, it's hard to see, but it's, um, you can see turquoise and pink. That one is batik and tie dye together. The green and white is just batik, right? So we just, we, we start with the plain fabric, we batik on it for the splashes, then you dye it green, and then you're done. And then the lines that you see at the top is also just batik. Again, we draw in the images and then you, you just, you, you draw it in with wax and then you dye it black and then you remove it. But what I, so, but the middle piece, that piece that has the, that has the turquoise and the pink, it's kind of a subtle thing, but you can see we first do tie dye on the fabric first to get the different colors, and then we go on top with batik. Um, I just love this dress; it's really fun. It's not on the, it's not out yet, but um, it's just one of my absolute favorites. I just love it. It's yeah. beautiful. These powerful dresses are from Tall Sisters. You just put, put if you order it, you just let me know. Similar, like we really try similar to. Um, oh my God! Now I'm scared of saying your name. Didn't you? No, don't worry about it. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're gonna practice on Facebook. I'm gonna get it. We'll practice on Facebook. But like what she said, um, I don't, I don't do full on custom, but I really encourage people to um, get short models. We'll get to that in a second. Um, I really encourage people to um, to tell me what their measurements are. If you're petite, if you're um, Niyama, you can you can vouch for this, right? Like you, we we go back and forth on your pieces and what you want, and I really try to make people happy. So. We changed a collar for her. We, I, I forgot, and then we, we did it. Like we really try to make our customers happy. And still have to send back. In terms of models, I mean, I think that there is, you know, there's sort of like the way we've been doing things for a long time, which I, you know, it's like you do hire this tall, skinny person, and that's what we've been doing, and that's not necessarily the right thing, right? There's some reasons for it in terms of like if I want to show like the full, you know, it just, it, I'm, I'm always wonder how much of it is programming and how much of it is like it is, can be easier. And when you are doing mm. thousand things to deal with, you know, um, but I think it's a really good point um, that the person is making um, and something that we're certainly thinking about. Um, so for next time, but she is a sweet woman and I do, she's amazing, um, Bukala, and she worked really hard for the shoot. Um, so let's see, let's go down to um, the one with the, next to the one with the bicycle, that one, this one at the bottom. Next, that one, yeah. So this print, um, this print, 
I wanted to share with you guys because this is a different technique um, and I'm not sure how much longer we'll be doing this one because it's so much freaking work. Um, I was inspired by, I saw a picture of like describing like networks, like phone networks and how they are created. And you know, the, the idea of like these, everybody is like a pod and then we're all connected, right? And I wanted to create it in fabric. And the only way to really create this is to essentially paint this fabric, like paint it. Because remember, everything is about color progression and what we do. But in this case, if you wanna create these multiple colors, you would have to dye the fabric like so many times, it's not gonna work. So in order to really create all of these different colors, we literally have to like paint each thing that you see. Um, so there's some dyeing and then a lot of it is just literally physical hand painting, which is so, it's such a tremendous amount of work that I'm not sure, um, this is, has to be like special order, I think, because as much as I love it and it's something really awesome about having an idea in your head and then being able to see it come to life, it's just the amount of work that goes into this piece, this garment is really astounding. And so more and more, I'm like, uh, I don't know. I love It'd it. It'd have to be a custom piece. Yeah, <laughs> they say, exactly. I want it. And then, yeah. Exactly. Because I at first, we were, you know, I put it on Instagram. And then the more I'm just looking at how much work it's taking to make one. And, and people don't always appreciate that, even if you try to explain, because they want their dress. And I get it. You know, but this this one is is, you know, because you, as you, you know, I've been describing things like we do tie dye and then you get, you can't do that with this thing. Like, it's just literally not possible. Like, because each, there's at least, I think, 11 different colors on here, you know, um, like 11 separate colors. So it's just, it's, it's really, uh, it's too hard. But it's, it's, it's my one of, it's my one of my new babies. I think that's beautiful. Be just make sure there's nothing else I wanted to talk about from the. Um, uh, go up a little bit more. Yeah, I think that's it. Maybe we can end with the pair, the orange and the orange and the purple. Well, let's talk about five three nine three. Do you see which what's five three nine three? Maria says she wants to talk about five three nine three. I don't know what that is. Oh, this one. Oh, okay. I was like, oh, it's so this one is um this is just a, a batik. So in a lot of um our motifs, you see that circle in a lot of Yoruba traditional motifs. And so I wanted to create a print. So about, I would say 25% of our work has like very Yoruba, like grounded meaning, but 75% doesn't. Interject. And that's deliberate. Like I want everybody to wear my clothes. Like people always say like, oh, can non-Black people, can non-Africans wear our clothes? In my opinion, yes. And I'll tell you why. Like there's some pieces that I don't recommend. And I will try, I try to say, you know, this may be too cult like culturally specific and like try to gear people to wear something else. But I do think it's, as Black artists, like I think it's important that we have access to the entire world market and we don't keep ourselves limited to just Black people. I really, I really believe that. I know that we can make enough money to support ourselves, but I'm also, we live in a very capitalistic society. And I think, you know, I think about my business and the amount of people that rely on this business to feed their families. And so that responsibility is an awesome one that I love, but also because of that, I have to think about how do I market my work, but also do it in a way that's authentic and true. So this particular fabric is, you know, does borrow more specifically from a Yoruba tradition in that that circular imagery imagery is something you see a lot in our, our, our work. Um, and then the, the, the shoulders are just the same fabric in blue and in orange. So I'm really, color mixing is like my whole thing right now. I don't, I don't know, once that's out, I don't know where else I'm gonna go. I just, everything. But yeah, that's that's how we ended up with this jumpsuit. And oh, and I, I really like making things that are really wearable. Like, you know, I really like, you know, just clothes that human beings can wear and, and women can wear. That's it. Well, all right. Thank you. Um, so uh, something that I, and, I, and actually, you kind of just answered it, but I'm gonna ask you this. Um, is the jumpsuit available yet? <laughs> you're on mute dear uh -oh. you're muted dear <laughs> um it it uh, tell her uh is that that's ray she's one of my customers she can just dm me yes is the <laughs> yes but i i yeah she's one of my really good customers so yes it is just dm me hu is always in the building 
Anyway, um, okay, so I was going to pose this question. You sort of just answered it, but I do wonder about, are you, Denisio sort of, I'm sorry, Denisio. <laughs> that was good, yeah. Denisio has sort of answered this um, in the sort of last remarks that she made, but I wonder about if you all are making these with, really? Uh, I don't know how to fix that. I'm sorry. Was it this low before? Oh, it's better now. It's it was a little bit lower, but now it's... I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, I'm like pushing the computer toward myself. Um, yeah, I was saying that I wonder about whether you're making this work with a particular group of people in mind. I mean, like, obviously, Denesio, you said, um, so yeah, let's talk about that. Oh, I'll jump in then. <laughs> so, um, I, no, I have to say when I first started, it was just for me. And then, um, then it turned into a business. And even with um, like trying to get it out there and talking to buyers and um, I mean, I have the pleasure of working with a lot of boutiques and um, but they were, they were in with my vision. But I've also spoken to like different um, like sales and marketing uh, teams who uh, wanted to help take my brand to the next level. And with that came a lot of compromise that I wasn't willing to, you know, do, oh, make the hoop smaller, or can you make that? And I was like, it changes the design. Like it's this way for a reason. So um, for me, it, I used to struggle with it. And um, when I first started, I have to say, because uh, like uh, Busayo said, you know, part of what we understand about the fashion industry is, you know, like you wonder if it's programming or if it's something like, oh yeah, this is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, I had to really uh, come to terms with what, what my um, success level, what success meant to me, um, how I was connecting with my customers and, um, and what was more important, you know? So for me, it was, um, it is keeping it um, more uh, made to order, um, keeping it uh, in small batches and not trying to, which, Okay, so not trying to, you know, like um, uh, achieve the success that usually um, most designers like, oh, I want to be in, you know, in, in Neiman and Bergdorf's and, you know, like Barney's and all these stores. And I've, and I've sat with buyers at all these great places. And, you know, immediately it's like, oh, yeah, your streetwear. Okay, we get it. Like, but my designs really doesn't reflect that, but it's because I'm black that, you know, I'm automatically categorized. And if that's not in vogue at the time, you know, like, so uh, for me, no, I'm like, I can't, uh, I design for, you know, I guess more of who I am, which can represent, you know, a group of women and uh, women of color. But, um, but overall, I try not to, uh, to to think of a specific market because then it starts limiting my creativity. I think that's a good place to be at. Yeah. Um, I think the only thing um, I would say is I, I think there are specific garments that I, I, I create with, especially the ones that are much more grounded in tradition that, that really seem like you know, that for me in my head, these are, this is for black people to wear, right? Like they just are so close to our, and I, I take a very diasporic view of blackness um, as I think we all should, but you know, for me, it's, I don't care where in the world you sit, but I, I really do believe they're black. It's, they're primarily from black women because they draw on this tradition. And I try to include that in, in what I'm, in the description of the garment, et cetera. Um, and then a lot of it, like the splash motif that I've been going crazy on, that's just my artistic expression. It's, it's just something I've always been obsessed with. The first time I thought about it, 
you see it a lot in Adira, but it's always like buried with all this stuff, you know? And then I said, you know, like, what if like, you, you know, you come out of a paintball fight and you just are like covered with like splashes of paint. Like what would happen if we just strip this down? And so the splash itself becomes like the centerpiece. And that, that design, which you see in a lot of our work is really just, you know, I think is really for everyone. Um, I do worry that as I tell the story around the brand, you know, that's where I think I've been getting some kind of like, well, you know, your page only has black people or like, you know, like your Instagram or, you know, there's so much talk about culture that like, are you leaving people like, so that's, you know, and for me, it's, I, I need to tell a very specific story about the work that I do. And I think the people that get it, get it. Um, and other people won't, you know, um, especially, you know, the marketing to the boutiques is, is a big thing, right? Like, you know, I, I was pitching to a platform recently and they were like, well, it looks like from your Instagram, like everything is so directed at the end consumer and it's not, you know, speaking to like a wider audience, right? I understand what the euphemisms are in that, you know, um, but I'm so happy. I'm so happy you brought up the selling to Barney's and Nordstrom's and all this It's like, that's where brands go to die. If anybody here is like listening, is trying to, to create a brand and trying to do fashion, like a big shop is, I mean, you do what you want to do, but what I can advise is like a big store like that is not a good idea. I agree. I feel like retail is slowly dying. These like big stores, these big department stores, there's a reason all of these are closing. Like, I think things are just moving towards this kind of, you know, individual brands and, and smaller boutiques. Um, so yeah, I just completely agree with that. Um, I would say that I, I think I do design specifically with a specific person in mind. And I feel like that it's important for me to make sure that, you know, any promotion I doing, any models that I use, I'm very, I'm very adamant about using black models um, because of representation, because, you know, all my life I've been forced to, you know, go to stores where I don't see myself and be okay with that and be okay with buying things. And I think from my experience with specifically with Dope Society, um, I have gotten questions about, you know, how I personally feel about white people wearing masks and stuff like that. And I always tell people that I have questions, um, but I'm not, it's not a brand where you're not allowed to wear, you know, a mask shirt. Um, I would wonder, I would wonder the reasons behind it or what, what it is about this image like, you know, connects with you. But um, I don't know, I think, I think I'm always, I, I kind of tried to get away from that for a while. And that's when I started designing these like statement shirts and trying to make my brand more universal. Um, and, and that's, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to have pieces that aren't specifically like, or literally tied to a culture is that, cause I think everything is, you know, inadvertently tied to my culture because I'm my culture. But um, I don't know. I, I think I'm, it's still something that I'm actually grappling with and still think about a lot. Um, yeah. I agree with what you said, Denisio. Even if it's not intentional, it's still going to, you know, like what we create is going to be for people who are a reflection of us, right? Because we're creating... Well, for me specifically, I create for myself and how I see myself is as a black woman, woman of color, because I am half Korean um, in, you know, in America. So, and my aesthetic comes from those uh, um, inspirations from our culture. So, but yeah, at the same time, I'm saying I don't, you know, think that, you know, I feel like anyone can wear my jewelry and I get warm reception from, from every different ethnic group. So yeah, you definitely thing. don't want to limit yourself, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, your, your inspiration comes from where, you know, from who you are. Yep. Um, Ray has a great comment in the chat. She said, as a consumer, I'm interestingly, I'm sorry, increasingly interested in who creates and why. Big stores don't provide that most times. I think context is important. Like, as I approach every element of what I do, context is critically important to everything. And I think this is part of why um, I asked three of you here for context. And then Maria said, 
Uh, skin tone doesn't necessarily determine our cultural background, nor what we art, nor what art we uh, relate to. So that's fair. Um, so we do have two questions in the Q&A specifically. Um, three questions now. Um, so there's a question for each of you from Bukola. So, Tisha, your recycled leather work is lovely and rendered in unexpected ways. Are you also investigating other leather alternatives, pineapple or fish leather, for instance? What are your hopes for pushing forward sustainability in your business? Hi. So, um, so I have thought about it and I'm really encouraged to see that there are more uh, vegan alternatives. I have a lot of vegan friends that, <laughs> that some are vegan and appreciate the fact that, um, that true, like my choice for leather isn't because it is, um, because it's looked at as a fine uh, fabric or material, but um, more, more in a um, not be wasteful way. Like I'm not a huge meat eater, but um, uh, we, because of the meat industry, we do have a lot of leather. Um, I personally use remnants um, and a lot of times just upcycle from clothing. So it's already existed. Um, it's not something that's being produced uh, new. And, um, and I seek out uh, vegetable tan leather, which um, is less harmful to the environment. So my, um, the thing I want to look into as far as uh, the fish leathers and the pineapple and the different um, uh, materials that they're creating to be leather-like is to um, just do more research to know how much impact it actually has on the environment. Because I feel like all this, uh, all the manufacturing and industrial waste isn't good for the environment either. So um, I, I definitely want to look into that more, but I'm encouraged that um, now um, I've moved recently to the mid Hudson Valley and there is a tannery there that works with farmers and uh, their hides are mostly from animals that die naturally. So, um, you know, if I can't get the remnants, which I used to just, you know, go down to the fashion district and go to some uh, leather suppliers and I just go through their bins of uh, remnant leather. And since now we're in a pandemic and <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work out, you know, it's easier for them to just sell, uh, you know, hides of leather than, um, and then bags and, you know, got to figure what you're going to get. Um, I'm encouraged that at least there are some uh, tanneries that are uh, working in a sustainable way, but it's something that I've actually thought about and going to look into. Thank you for the question. Brilliant. So next question is, I mean, there are two here, one for the remaining two guests. Um, I'm going to go with Busayo to continue the alphabetical order that we've begun. Um, also from Bukola. I'm interested in returning home to Nigeria to also apprentice with traditional indigo and modern dye adire artisans as part of my art practice. Do you encounter any reluctance from artisans to working with you since you were coming from abroad? Do you have any recommendations for how best to approach artisans in Lagos or elsewhere to become an apprentice? Thank you in advance. Love your work and your storytelling. Oh, thank you. Um, so when I started, um, I started in um, Abelkuta. Um, and still do most, like, I would say most of my training and apprenticeship there. Um, and Abelkuta is like, um, well, Bukala, you probably know where it is. It's in Oko State, but it's, Abelkuta is the home of some of the fiercest Nigeria people in the world. So Fela is from there. Wale Shoyinka is from there. Uh, you know, they're the Egba people. They were sort of like the warrior class. Um, they're from Abelkuta, and Abelkuta is also known for its dyeing and it's just rich dyeing tradition. 
Um, and I think, you know, it took a long time to get people to open up and to be welcoming. It, it's something that you have to work on and you have to develop relationships. Um, I think just like with everything, I think part of it is how, how, um, how dedicated are you? How, how do you approach people, right? Um, you know, I always lead, led from like my curiosity and just wanting to learn and have more questions. Um, and so that's really was what, um, that's, that's how I was able to do it, but it took a period of time. It took, you know, going back and being really, um, just asking questions, buying from people in the beginning and then using that to kind of open up the conversation. Um, so it definitely takes time. Um, I think, but I think so much of our artisan traditions from the textiles to the wood, like all that stuff is, is dying out. Um, and I think increasingly more people are, are realizing that they do have to kind of teach younger people how to do this work because a lot of people in Nigeria, they, you know, like everybody, nobody wants to do this kind of hard backbreaking work all the time. And so a lot of it is just sort of, you know, kids go to school and they don't want to do it anymore. So it just took time, you know, I, I started, I've been doing this since 2011, right? It's only now that I finally feel like, okay, things are going well, you know, it's been nine years, right? Like it takes a really long time, but it's certainly doable. Brilliant. Um, one more question from Ukola for Dennis Hill. Hand woven, hand dyed textiles, mud cloth, indigo, et cetera, tend to be thick. Have you encountered any technical challenges or adjustments in making fluid wearable clothing with these textiles? That is a good question. Um, yes, <laughs> I have. Um, uh, luckily, I've been able to work with a supplier um, in Harlem, uh, Mokhtar Yara. He used to own a shop in Harlem called uh, Yara Fabrics, uh, but now he exclusively works out of his, uh, whatchamacallit, his warehouse. Um, but he's been really just a godsend. Um, so when working in working with him and getting my fabrics, I asked specifically for kind of the um, the lighter kind of less thick uh, mud cloth because the, all of these textiles are handmade, you know, hand woven like on a loom. Um, some of them tend there's no like consistency um, per se, which I love because it just kind of means every single piece, every single like fabric is just unique in its own way. Um, so he already knows that I, I've shown him like what I make them with and the things that I make with. And so he tends to find me lighter ones, but overall, not really a great summer, <laughs> a summer kind of textile, um, which is why I launched that initial collection in January. Um, they are, they tend to be a lot heavier. Um, I like the structure of them. I like the heavy drape of them, especially when it comes to like shift dresses and stuff. Um, I find it a little bit more flattering um, than like a more flowy fabric. It just feels more like a, um, I don't know, feels more like, I don't want to say expensive, but it just feels more sumptuous. Like there's, there's more body to it. There's more tooth to it, if that makes any sense at all. Um, so I actually like working with the heavier fabrics and the more kind of structured things. I come from a knit background. I really love knits. That's like my first love. Um, I would love to try to come up with something that is similar to mud cloths or even something similar to my own country's traditional fabrics. There's this fabric called country cloth in Liberia that has kind of similar stripes to indigo, but it's a very, it's a much lighter color fabric. And I'd like to emulate some of those um, in unexpected kind of textiles like knits and more stretchier kind of fabrics. Um, so that's something I'm currently working on. I'm probably going to be hitting you up, Busayo, because I really want to get into making my own textiles. I think what you do is so beautiful, and I just, I, I got ideas. <laughs> um, so yeah. <laughs> beautiful. We have a question from Dina Rudine. Hello, Dina. This is um, Dina's a dope uh, jewelry designer and myriad oh. things. Um, herself. As Black artists seek greater representation in the marketplace, for example, film, fine art, music, etc., how does this relate to cultural appropriation in fashion? Meaning, wouldn't reaching a wider audience equate to reaching a white market? Um, you know, 80% of my business right now is Black women, right? So, and we're, it's not, 
I'm not lo- I'm not searching out for other people. Like black women have kept the lights on up till now, right? Um, and I would say all my events. I mean, that's that's actually been true since the day I started, right? And even now, with even the wider kind of more people coming into the party, so to speak, it's still that core consumer is still the numbers haven't changed. It's still about seventy percent black women are still the ones ordering. Uh, my clothes, you know, we had the best month last month and it was, there were, I mean, literally if I break it down, it would be black women that were like responsible for 80% of it, right? So I don't think, I hear what you're saying. I think it's such a powerful, me and my father talk about cultural appropriation quite a bit. Um, He's a religious studies professor in traditional African religion. And when Beyonce's uh, Lemonade video came out, we, we, him and I ended up having this conversation he was in Germany, the audio is terrible, but we did like an interview with him. And I remember, cause talking to him about, you know, Oshun, the imagery of Oshun kind of being everywhere. And what are his thoughts as someone who's really grounded and a learned scholar of that tradition about, you know, this, you know, cause he, he didn't know who Beyonce was. And so people were calling to ask him for quotes about her. And he was like, he didn't, he didn't have any context for it. And like, he was just like, well, why is Oshun like so popular all of a sudden? And then I was explaining to him. So we had this conversation and he said something, he said, you know, he believes culture is like smoke. Uh, Once you release it into the world, like, or art is like smoke, like you don't really get to control and hold it. And I disagree with him to a certain extent, but I think it's a useful thing to think about, you know, and a lot of times when I go home and I I say something about cultural appropriation to like Nigerians, they're like, wait, what are you, what? Like they don't have any sense of what the conversation is about. And I think it has, of course, to do with power, right? And of, of course, the society, the problem. I remember the first time I posted the Inru Kiko um, hairdo, so many people who loved it and were excited. And then like there was a few number of black women who were like, don't post this. You're gonna see this in, in Vogue or on some fashion show. And this is gonna be like very upsetting. Like they were quite, that, that someone was gonna rip this off and they're not wrong. And it's, I think it's a fair question, but I, it's something I, I still struggle with. But I also believe that when you create something, it can't be that I created this thing, you know, especially something that's abstract. And I'm like, well, this group of people can't wear it. Like that to me doesn't feel, doesn't feel right, doesn't feel authentic. I do think there are things that I do create that are so grounded in culture. There is something, especially if somebody were to put it on and they have no idea what the context was right um just a short story uh i years ago i was in nigeria and i fell in love with these red beads that the delta people wear they're from the south south of nigeria right and they're these beautiful red beads and i the one for the neck people wear it at weddings and it's for brides but for the one for the hand i was like oh my god this is the cutest thing it's like a bracelet and it attaches to like a ring right so i buy one and i put it on and i get to the airport and people are like, hello, princess, hello, princess. And literally five, six people call me princess before I get to the door. And I'm like, okay, that's weird. So I'm in Nigeria, I'm a black person, but, and then finally somebody came up to me and they were like, oh, princess. And then they kind of looked at my bracelet. And then I was like, wait a second. So then I asked somebody and they were like, oh, those, those bracelets are for literally princesses in the Delta, right? This is a different tribe than me, but I had no idea. So to me, that was a perfect example, right? Of like how even... I, as a Nigerian, can culturally appropriate. And the way that you do it, that is wrong, right? I just bought something because I thought it was cute. I put it on. But for a group of my fellow Nigerians, it has a very specific meaning, right? Um, so that, that's, that's the example. That, thank you. Okay, exactly. That, that to me is when, you, when it goes wrong. Brilliant. Do uh, you two need me to reread the question? Yeah. As Black artists see greater representation in the marketplace, for example, in film, fine art, music, etc., how does this relate to cultural appropriation in fashion? Meaning, wouldn't reaching a wider market equate to reaching a white market? Um, and there was actually a secondary question that technically probably should have been a part of the first question. How can this be managed in a way without compromising authenticity? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's definitely something that I think about constantly as, as my company has expanded and continues to expand. Um, I feel like kind of similar to what I was talking about earlier that 
I'm really intentional when it comes to the messaging, the marketing, the promotional materials that I disseminate, you know, for Dope Society. And I feel like as long as I'm very specific about, you know, how I, how I showcase my work, I feel like the people that need to see it and want to see it and, you know, connect to it, will see it. Um, and for the most part, that's been, I mean, I think with my customer base, it's about 95% black. Um, and it's been that way, um, even as I've like grown um, quite a bit over the few, uh, past seven years. So I haven't really had too much of an issue with that. Um, but the, with regards to the appropriation thing, that is something that I, I struggle with, you know, being both African, right, and a Black American. Like, I was born in, in the U.S., um, my dad's Black American, um, and kind of straddling these two worlds. Um, I'm still, you know, I'm still not exactly sure. Like, I'm sure that there are people that could look at what I'm doing with, like, taking a mask that's traditionally used in very specific, very, you know, ceremonial things. I'm very, I'm very aware of it and I'm very careful with like not ever using the mask in its full you know with the full regalia like using it in a way that's like traditionally like for spirituality but um I think it's a fair argument that somebody might look at that and be like well that's kind of you appropriating you know this mask or just using it for aesthetical reasons and not you know anything deeper so I think I don't know I it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to get right um, I think just intention and full like kind of um, transparency with your work um, has been working for me. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I haven't I haven't had the issue of feeling like oh I'm re reaching too many white people yet. <laughs> I mean that might become a problem if I got you know even bigger. But for the most part, I think my marketing has been effective enough that I'm reaching exactly who I want to reach. Um, And I'm just going to speak to, as I'm reading the question that uh, Dina posed uh, about, um, so seeking greater representation and how does that relate to cultural appropriation and fashion? I kind of feel like, yeah, that can happen, but I don't think it's in the designer's hands necessarily, unless you see that you're being used in that way, you know? So I do feel like, yeah, there is, you know, there are more um, stores and, brands who will um, seek out uh, more Black designers um, because they want to be on the right side of history, right? Or, or hopefully they're actually trying to truly um, be more inclusive. But um, I think it could fall into cultural appropriation in fashion um, when it's left in the hands of white people making those decisions. But I do feel like... Um, I mean, if anything, um, 2020 has been very uh, transformational for a lot of people and, um, and people are, you know, truly expressing their voice. So when they see it, they call it out. So I don't feel like um, um, it's going to be done in the same way where, um, before designers, um, I don't think designers, uh, black designers and people of color feel as beholden to that white market anymore either. So, and because there are way more, there, there are, you know, many ways that you can sell your product. There's no gatekeeper anymore where it used to be, you know, like you had to go one way and that was it. So I do think that, um, I'm hoping, and I, I, I feel like people are just way more aware that there will be less of it as there is a greater representation in all those creative forms. Um, so, I mean, that, that's how I answer it. And I don't think, um, and as far as compromising your authenticity, um, I just like to say artists change, <laughs> you know, like sometimes like, you, you know, like you have your inspiration and then maybe you don't. And I kind of, you know, sometimes uh, uh, some may consciously change their design because they're trying to seek a wider audience, which there's nothing wrong with that. 
And, um, and then some change may change their design because that's just what inspires them at the moment. So if you see that happening with other designers or artists, you know, like just understand, you know, try to find out where they're coming from because um, it's not always about, um, you know, trying to get the seat at the table or compromising your art. But, you know, as artists, we grow, you know, and, and we have different inspirations. So that's all I want to say about that. That's a really good point. Um, because I feel like a, a lot of my work has changed um, specifically with like design work. And so it's not always necessarily like some sort of, you know, scheme to like, you know, broaden my horizon or broaden my, you know, fan base or anything like that. Sometimes it's just a change in design or not wanting to be so literal, you know, um, and thinking that my designs will always come from this very black, very kind of African aesthetic, but it might not always look exactly what you think African aesthetic looks like, you know, that looks like many things, you know, that's a very varied, diverse thing. Um, so I, I'm really glad you said that, Tisha, because I agree. Um, so Sana Musa Sama has a question that I sort of answer, but you all may have other answers. So here it is. How does one know they are wrongly using a symbol? That's a good question. I think my example was a really, oh, sorry. I think my no, no, no. <laughs> a really good one, right? Like I bought something that I didn't know what it meant. I just bought it because it was cute, right? And I put it on and this is, and then it means something very, very specific to the people that, from whose culture it comes from, right? So I think that to me, that's, that's, and then I think your own intention, right? My intention when I purchased it was, this is cute. I'm going to put it on, right? It wasn't like I hadn't spent time learning about it. I hadn't spent I didn't, I, I literally was, I think I bought it either that day or the day before. And I was just like, oh my God, I have to have this, you know? And so because my own intention was just very, it was so grounded in the aesthetic, right? And coming from the culture I come from, I really should know better because so much of what we do is imbued with meaning. There's so little in, you know, when you look at cultures across Nigeria that we just, do, a lot of times we just don't do things just to do them. They have meaning, they have a tradition, they have a history. So even your, your, your simple bead, right? Like a, a necklace or something like that. They all have cultural meaning. So because I bought it in a moment of just like, let me just be cute, right? As opposed to like an investigative spirit or um, most likely if I'd researched it, I would have known that these things were for princesses and I'm not a princess. I mean, I am in my mind, but you know, I don't want the whole world to see me as such. And so I wouldn't put it on because that's not the lineage that I have. So I think a lot of times when people fall into the cultural, at least cultural appropriation that feels violent to me, um, and I, I don't use that word lightly, but I do think sometimes there's a certain amount of violence um, that comes with it, is when you have, uh, um, you know, you don't have equal power, for example, right? So like the Imru Kiko thing, I understood what people were saying because lo and behold, Vogue could very well put it on the cover and say, oh my God, we invented this hairstyle. And because of that imbalance in power, between the Nigerian hairstylist who made the hair for me and Vogue magazine, like no one's gonna ever question or doubt like who, who came up with that style, right? So I think the things about how do you, the question is like, how do you use it inappropriately? How do you know? I think sometimes you know it when you see it because it feels wrong. But then also I think what is the intention with which you're approaching that particular piece? Have you done your work? Have you done your research? Because it will change if you're a learned basically normal human being, it will change how you present something, right? Do you show something with reverence? Do you just like slap it on there? If you've done the work to know what the thing actually means to the people that created it and from which you've gotten it. Yeah, you answered it right, Naima. <laughs> Not, oh, Naima. <laughs> I always call you Naima. So say it, no. Actually, saying my name to me though. I know. Hey, girl. No. <laughs> hey, girl. Hey. Like, what's up, sis? What say after that. It's fine. Um, let me see. Is there? Yeah, there's more questions. That's not really a question. Um. Mm -hmm. Maria has asked this following. Also, it's almost three o'clock. Is everybody good? Yeah. 
Maria Elino has asked, Western artists have taken so much inspiration from African art, for example, Pablo Picasso and the whole development of Cubism. Why can't it go the other way? We all have the right to learn from whatever culture inspires us, whether we incorporate it into our art or not. That is a different question. Um, I mean, is, I don't know, if, is this a question? It feels not really a question, but if you all have thoughts, feel free to share them. I mean, there's historical context, there's power dynamics, like, I, yeah, I'm not sure. It's not, it's like, it's not an inverse thing because things are not equal. Like it's, it almost feels like it's bordering on the like, you know, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe somebody else has a better <laughs> way of explaining it, but I don't, yeah, I don't think it's not, it can't be the inverse, like, because that has been the dominant majority, like, culture, right? Like, Western culture has, you know, white supremacy has made it so that that is supposedly the culture and all these other cultures are less than, or given names like primitive art or whatever, like, you know, labels. So I don't, I, I don't know. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I didn't see that. <laughs> <Sorry. Yeah. laughs> I read it and I was like, oh, that's not really a question, actually. Yeah, I don't know. Let's try to answer a non-question. <laughs> um, this question is from an anonymous, can I just say that I don't necessarily love this anonymous attendee business. I don't love it. Um, if you if you got the cojones to ask a question, then ask it. Like I don't know why we got to do the anonymous thing. No shade to you, whoever you are. Question in response to Busayo's last answer: How exactly does one justify that as a textile or anything for that matter has culturally appropriated when the use of said textile has mostly disappeared locally or where the textile is being made? In I'm Nigerian and I honestly have to do a double take finding and to take what. Find anyone wearing a dairy anywhere. Do you think your market is more abroad? Okay, I'm reading the question too, just to make sure I understand. Uh, how exact does one? Okay, no, I understand the question. Um, so I'm not, I'm not arguing that. Adire, if somebody who is non-Nigerian wears it is cultural appropriation. I've not said that. Um, and Nigerians, I mean, I do think the, the, the questioner is right in that, you know, I think when you look at what Nigerians wear, right, Ankara is still at the top. And then if you go to like a fancy Nigerian party, it's like Swiss lace, it's George, it's, um, there's still some Ashoke, but Ashoke, which is, um, which is, which is, Asho Oke is like our traditional clothing. It's, it's, but it's also the, in the hierarchy of clothing, it's considered at the, the top, right? But it really means like clo cloth of the countryside, right? Um, so it's like, if you're having a wedding, if you're having a big celebration, that woven fabric is what people wear. So that's, that, that's considered the very top. But now we used to make a lot of Asho Oke ourselves, but now it's like cheap Chinese um, imports of Asho Oke is basically what most people wear, right? So George is not made in Nigeria, lace is not made in Nigeria, and Kara, for the most part, as I said earlier at the top, you know, to me is like the biggest, most successful colonial project in the sense that the Dutch wanted to destroy, you know, the Indonesian local economy. They steal this design from the Indonesians to sell back to them, but we as Africans are like, sell it to us, we want it, right? That's another conversation. But so I've not said in this conversation that and they're being worn by anybody is cultural appropriation. What I'm saying is, if there's specific motifs, specific things that are very Yoruba in a specificity, and I put that, and I choose to put that on a garment, and somebody were to wear it and didn't have any context for it, if somebody were to come up to them and say, like, what are you wearing, then that's a different conversation, right? But I certainly think that um, the, the questioner brings up a really great point in terms of what's happening in terms of textiles on the continent. And the fact that the importation of textiles from all over the world has really taken over in terms of what people on the continent are buying and wearing, right? Like they, there's very little local production, which is part of why I love what I get to do. 
um, even though the, the fabric itself is not made in Nigeria, right? It's made, it's important in China, but the fact that we can be creating the work itself in Nigeria is a huge, it, it just makes me feel awesome. And I do think more increasingly, I'm getting more clients in Nigeria for my work. Um, that's been a new development. Um, so it, more and more, I'm getting more customers who are Nigerian based, who are buying the work. Um, but but I, I think the, the questioner raises a good question in terms of what's happening in the continent, in terms of textiles and the fact that everything is imported from China and India and, and anywhere but on the continent, right? If I may, um, there's also another similarly anecdotal thing. Um, a friend in Trinidad has a business called Bene Carib. I think Ray probably knows this person also. And they also are using that those like traditional batik techniques and like purposefully employing people in other parts of the Caribbean to make that fabric and to, to keep that tradition alive. So I think this is something that, you know, because of the nature of globalization and the global economy, that's just what we're going to see people not necessarily attaching worth to the things that come from their own culture. This is like a, this is a colonial thing. This is like a globalization thing. There's a lot of layers to that. And I'm, I'm so happy to see now that we're really purposefully trying to shift that narrative and, and purposefully support our own cultures and support, like everything that I wear for these conversations is typically made by black women. These earrings, this dress, Every week, that is an intentional choice that I make to wear black things, right? Um, does it, as you said before, what is, what is an African aesthetic? What does that mean? And of course, this is a very sort of trite, digestible way of approaching that. But no, like it means a lot of things and it can look a lot of different ways. And this is also why we are here today. So thank you, anonymous attendee, for that question. <laughs> I don't know if either of you have an additional thing to add about that. That was a great response, Messiah. Okay. Uh, that's not really a question either. Yeah, it's not really a question. Um, well. I think we're in a good place. I think one of the last things that I wanted to ask, um, Busayo, you specifically referenced your father's work um, around African spirituality and religious systems. I'm wondering about, because I feel like it's in there for a few, and I'm wondering about what is, what is Ray saying? Mm. So you've asked the question in the chat. I may come to it, but it's taking us, we're going in a different direction. So I'm sorry, I might not answer that question. Um, but I'm wondering about your, your thinking around the spirit. Cause you know, so much of like what we're drawing from is looking at adornment as actually a spiritual act, right? And I wonder about if, you, if you're thinking about that at all, particularly like T Tisha, you're saying that part of the inspiration for the hoop is that Fulani earring. Like that's also a very specific context. And I just wonder about how that may or may not play into the way that you approach making your work, designing pieces, et cetera. In particular- On the spiritual level. <laughs> so, Busayo, that Pete, that there was a dress. Let me see if I still have it open. I think I did. I close it. I didn't. Um, I'm gonna actually share the screen to show what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, this joint. So you were talking about this uh, pattern, and I was like, uh huh. <laughs> Talk about it. Um, but that, that has like a very specific meaning, but also it's not just that that's like only as I like look around the world and look at all of these symbols that people are using across cultures, like that symbol is something that is actually present a lot in a lot of different cultures as well. Yeah. Um, so, so this is kind of, I'm like, I'm asking a sort of esoteric question right now, but. Um, yeah, I think. <laughs> So there's a few garments we've made. That one, there's one that we use the cowrie a lot, the cowrie shell um, quite a bit. And the cowrie is such a complicated symbol, you know, for black people, right? 
it, it it's used in divination, but it also was used as currency to buy black people, right? And 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 so I remember one of my garments, I posted this up and this sister wrote me, she's become a friend and she wrote me and she said, you know, that's a very painful, she's black American. She said, that's a very painful print when I, when you posted it, right? It was very painful for me because the cowrie to me means something very violent and like the, the selling of, of my people, right? So that's, that, that was one that, that, that conversation I had with her was actually really powerful too for me to begin to think about what do some of these African symbols mean? What it means to me as a Yoruba person is very different than it might mean to somebody as a black American, right? So um, the more tradition, but, but to, I'm gonna come back to your question in that as I've done this work, my own connection and my journey back to my cultural tradition. So we were raised in a very Christian home even though my father is a scholar of African religion. So we were always thought to have a very healthy respect for, for it because many Nigerians are just like, no, that, that's fetish, it's over here. But what this work is doing and the trips back home and the conversations I'm having is really returning me to, um, first of all, I'm learning so much about the traditional culture and traditional practices. But I think it's uh, when th when this ends, I have a feeling that my own spiritual identity and the way I think about myself spiritually will be significantly different. And we're and it's still in process. Um, but a, a conversation I had with this gentleman this trip when I went in March, um, Professor Jagade, he is a Methodist minister and he's also a Babalao, and him and I had a conversation that literally rocked me to my core. Because what he said to me was, you know, when I started, he was a Methodist minister and he started investigating traditional African belief. And he said, you know, so much of what had been told him about traditional Yoruba, Ifa uh, belief systems was that it's demonic, it's satanic, it's fetish. This is what Nigerians in Nigeria believe. And he said he came to this understanding one day where he said, if those things are true, that would mean my generations, his great grandmother, his great great grandmother, who he knew were demonic, fetish, right? And satanic. And he knew that they were none of those things. So that him going through this period of mental decolonization, which I'd never even heard, the, a Yoruba man in his 50s talking to me about mental decolonization, you guys, like what that did, you know, where we've been taught to really believe, and now we believe it ourselves, we perpetuate it ourselves. So to answer the question, what this work has done and the level, I think the last two years has made me really come to terms with the fact that this is, this is not just work that's just pretty or came just out of nowhere. This is things that have been done by generations of people. These are technologies that people have passed down generationally, right? And this, the violence that we continue to perpetuate on ourselves, right? And that was perpetuated on us is that we were severed from this rich culture, right? And then we continue to just put it aside and say, we don't have anything to do with it, right? And that is now, to me, that's now our responsibility. We own that now. So I don't know if I answered the question, but as I learn more about the place I've come from, my spirituality is certainly evolving and changing. And I think you'll begin to see that more in the work. Ladies. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm actually having a very similar kind of awakening and kind of learning of my own, you know, culture, similar to what Busai was saying. Um, I feel like it's very similar in Liberia. Traditional, traditional, you know, belief systems are demonized to the fact that I don't even know any of any of like, you know, the history. I know about certain secret societies and, you know, I know what I know based on my own personal research on various masks and stuff that I use in my artwork. But beyond that, like there's no oral tradition of like, you know, what, what a traditional ceremony would look like or what deities were, you know, worshiped or what ancestors were worshiped or what an altar would look like, it, like in Liberia. And even specific to like my tribe, the crew tribe, I know nothing about it um, because all of that stuff was just, you know, pushed off to the side and it was okay to, you know, hang a mask up on the wall for aesthetic reasons and because it looked cool. But like beyond that, there was no thing. So it's, it's a constant learning thing for me. Um, as you were saying that, I was thinking about, you know, 
how I came to like find this specific Dan mask and why it resonated with me so much when I first saw it. Um, and before I officially had launched Dope Society, I tested it out a few times on a t-shirts, on t-shirts and stuff. Um, clothing has always been a way of expressing myself in ways that words fail me because I'm not a talker, I'm a very shy person. Um, but for me, <laughs> but for me, like clothing was the vehicle to like express myself and it has been a religious experience, experience and almost a, you know, spiritual kind of vehicle for me to like show who I am. Um, and so I was putting these masks on t-shirts before I was selling them, um, just as a way of expressing myself. Um, and then later on, as I did more research on the Dan tribe and specifically these sets of masks, I learned that they're used as protection. Um, they're used in these traditional ceremonies, but as like the time evolved, the use for these masks, you know, evolved and people actually carry these small kind of passport masks is what they call them, you know, in their person or as they're traveling just for protection for like good juju to like, you know, ward off any sort of like bad vibes. And that made perfect sense to me for why I wanted to use them for my, you know, for my work and my artwork. Um, so yeah, I do think there's spirituality kind of imbued, even though I wouldn't call myself this really religious person, person I, I'm constantly aware of like what's at work, you know, behind the, behind the scenes, so to speak, behind the veil with what I do. Um, and I think it's something that I just constantly need to learn. And I, I agree with Busai, it's something that our generation needs to be more aware of and do the work for because it's gonna disappear, you know? Yeah. So you were gonna say something before. Yeah, no, I was going to say I agree with, well, now I agree with <laughs> what both ladies said. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess um, first, the, my inspiration, um, just it comes from my culture. And it's been heavily influenced by um, American culture, because that's, you know, I was born and raised here. My father's uh, African American. My mother is Korean. She was born and raised in Korea. And I've found that I've been exploring um, more of those cultural adornments lately as inspiration for uh, my jewelry and creating um, some collections. But, um, but overall, the spirituality for me, I think in creating uh, the brand, it's more about uh, connection with family and uh, my roots with uh, my father's family in the South and, um, and getting back to what was familiar and what was common for most Black Americans, um, which was, you know, yeah, we had like three seamstress in, um, in our family. So that's where you went, that's who made the clothes, you know, really um, ready to wear was a luxury, you know? <laughs> And and now it's like the opposite, you know, but um, um, but yeah, for me, uh, the just creating overall is a spiritual journey for me. But what I do enjoy about um finding influence in art and um in imagery that is more cultural, um, just doing the research and learning more about it and how we can, um, uh, how I can incorporate it into my designs, but also, as the lady said, how we can teach the next generation or just, you know, let people, you know, help people understand that we come from a rich tradition that has been taken away from us uh, of textile and creativity, uh, metal smithing and you know i feel like especially um black americans are like uh y'all forgot like we were the um the agricultural we were we were the backbone you know we can grow our own food you know like we wove and made the clothing we can make our own clothes like we are capable and for a long time were the only source for those things but we've been so far removed and have been fed this lie of you know after reconstruction about being lazy and worthless and you know that we don't see the value in 
those things and those crafts and those arts and we don't um see that you know or or we see it sometimes we look at it uh like talking about sustainability like composting and you know <laughs> recycling and stuff which i feel like you know well for sure my family always did you know but it wasn't uh i mean it was embarrassing like i remember <laughs> my aunt used to go to the supermarket and bring her own bag and I was embarrassed you know that she would bring a reusable bag um to the supermarket and this was in the 80s so you know plastic is king still is so um but now it's chic and now it's um as looked at as uh something white people do but you know I think it is our job to encourage and to teach our traditions and um what our legacies are so that's i guess the spiritual journey that i think all creatives kind of go through you know i think i feel like at first you start out at you know just from your perspective but then once you realize how influenced you've been by the world around you and your family and um the, and the culture that you start taking on that responsibility You know, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, so thank y'all so much. I really, 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 really appreciate you joining today. Everyone who has stayed for the conversation, I totally appreciate your presence. Um, I have put everyone's IG handle and websites into the chat, so please check out their work. Um, and thank you for being here and asking these important questions. Um, buy some shit from them. Thank you. <laughs> I'm poor now. So. Hi, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you. I know. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank I love you for it. having me. Yes. Amazing. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful afternoon. If you're in New York, enjoy this heat. I think it's probably sweltering in New Orleans, so you enjoy that. <laughs> I will not. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> well, you could go get some beignets. Can you do that for me? I, I can. I gotta. I gotta wear that mask though. At least, yeah. You can get so <laughs> many things that you can get. So many things that we can't get over there. Eat well. Uh, the food here, yeah. This just. Is, there's no comparison. <laughs> yeah, but Bourbon Street. There were all these people. Please be careful. Oh, I don't go anywhere near the French Quarter. I don't. I was like, what, what, what world are these people living in? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a lot of tourists that are just just free, free, wild and free. I don't know. I don't please, know please be careful. <laughs> yeah, wear your mask, people. Wear your mask. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 So much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>